Welcome to the podcast, everyone. We just started. Nothing has happened. Uh, I yep. am your not host, Sam Shin. And before we get started today, I want to talk to you guys. Remember, and just sign up for the Patreon, you know, Ball Patreon. Um, right. Please do. It's awesome. Uh, we've got a lot of extra content in there. Um, one extra bonus episode a week. Plus, you get any of our um, updated content, any of that stuff. Um, I work really hard on it. Trill doesn't do a lot of work, but you know, like exactly. We yeah. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. That was a brilliant introduction. Also, if you want to watch episodes when we record them live early in the week, hop on to the Unoball playback. Link is in the description for all of this stuff. But let's just dive right into what we want to talk about today, which is the trade deadline, obviously. We're a little over a month away from the NBA trade deadline. We have Slop coming out. We had our first official trade of Slop season. I don't count the Harden trade because... Harden is in his own category of slop. Mm-hmm. He's so unpredictable. He can ask out at any time. He can get traded at any time. So him, I feel like Harden and Kyrie are in like their own tier of slop. That, that, that's not even, it's its own thing. But now we had an actual trade. We discussed it on the last episode, the OG Ananobi Emmanuel quickly trade. Uh, yes, I left out RJ Barrett on purpose. Um, but so that so that trade goes down, we react to it, and now we're looking forward to the deadline, which is about a month away, like I said. And we have a number of teams that should be buyers and sellers. The narrative that people are saying now is there are too many buyers and not enough sellers. I wrote down a list of teams I think should be sellers here, and I'll give my case on why they should be sellers as opposed to Will they actually sell? We can debate that when we get to those teams. But let's start up top with the buyers. We're going to do a buyer each. So I'll draft a buyer, you draft a buyer. Okay. Then, then I'll draft a seller, you draft a seller. Okay. And I want to start up top with my beautiful Philadelphia 76ers. Okay. <clears throat> so the number one pick in the buyers and sellers draft is the Philadelphia 76ers. The reason that I am bringing them up top is because I think the majority of teams don't have a ton of contracts that they can trade at this deadline. The Sixers do. The majority of teams don't have a ton of picks that they can trade at this deadline. The Sixers do. And they also, a lot of teams operate differently than the way that Daryl Morey does. Daryl Morey is someone who, if he has the ability to improve the roster at the deadline, he will at least trade for one rotation player. That's generally been his thing. Since he's been here in Philly, it's been, I would say, up and down. One year he traded for George (laughs) Hill. That didn't work at all. The next year he traded for James Harden. That worked, but to what level, we can't really tell because I don't really think Harden was fully himself until the following season. And then last year, he famously salary dumped Matisse Theibel and pitched it as taking a flyer on Jalen McDaniels and then let Jalen McDaniels walk after the season. So, so far, he's basically one for three, I would say, at these trade deadlines. But now we are coming up to this deadline where they have a ton of contracts they can trade. They have picks. And where I'm at with it is uh, anyone who listens to the podcast knows, anyone who follows me on Twitter knows, I would be more than happy to trade Tobias Harris. I'm 100%. I don't think he affects winning On this team specifically, I don't really think he fills a huge need. I think we've seen it time and time again in the playoffs, specifically in that Celtics matchup, that he's someone that will probably struggle when you get deeper into the playoffs, not only on defense, but also on offense. Having said that, I went through and I tried to figure out three teams in the last 35 years were the only teams I could find that traded a starter mid-season, and went on to win the NBA Finals. Can you guess who those three were? I saw most of it on the thing. I would have been able to get um, the Raptors trading Jonas Valanciunas for Marc Gasol because that Which, is the most recent example. To be fair, Jonas Valanciunas mm-hmm. only started 10 of 30 games that year. They were starting Serge Ibaka. Mm, interesting. So he only played Gasol. By the time they traded him, he wasn't even starting for them anymore. So mm-hmm. that kind of counts. But mm-hmm. Tobias has started every game he's played for the Sixers. So that's, mm-hmm. I almost would even say that doesn't count. Yeah. 
Like they yeah. had already figured out that they were moving on from Jonas Valanciunas is basically what I'm trying to get at here. So I think that, that there were signs that season. And then the other one, the other two that I posted about were um, the famous one from the 90s, which was the Rockets trading Otis Thorpe for Clyde Drexler at the deadline. And Clyde was still a top 5, 10 player in the NBA at the time. Anyone would have done that trade. Like Otis Thorpe mm-hmm. was a little bit older uh, they did win the championship the year before, and he was an all-star three years before that, I think. But mm-hmm. he was like a one-time all-star, a really nice player. But if you have the opportunity to upgrade from Otis Thorpe to Clyde Drexler, any team would do that. And then do you know what the third one is? The one that I that I didn't mention in that tweet. Um, the Dantley for uh, Mark Aguirre. Aguirre. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Which was the famous trade that happened. They lose to the... The Pistons lose to the Lakers in the NBA Finals. The next year, they trade Adrian Dantley, who was towards the end of his career, but was a multi-time All-Star. Average like had many seasons where he averaged like thirty points a game. Traded him for Mark Aguirre at the deadline. The Pistons then go on to win the next two NBA Finals. Mark Aguirre was a three-time All-Star. He was someone that was. At the time, it was seen as a crazy move, and it obviously paid off in retrospect. But my whole point on this is that Daryl Morey cares a lot about history when it comes to constructing his rosters and making his moves. Outside of that midseason James Harden trade, which was a unique opportunity that presented itself because Ben Simmons was sitting out, the majority of his trades are not that he does in season are not involving high minute players. So, like, not starters, not guys who are key to the team's regular season success and all of that. And and like I said, I so I'm approaching this deadline thinking the players that are more likely to get traded are players like Robert Covington. You can't trade Nicholas Batum. He's been too good. He's been amazing for the team. Um, Marcus Morris, Furkan Korkmaz, Daniel House. You still have, like I said, you still have upwards of – $35 $35 million in expiring contracts between those five players. You can almost get close to 40 even if you wanted to make multiple moves. But my gut feeling here is that because of this history, they're not going to trade Tobias Harris at this deadline. And if they did move on from Tobias, I think they would just let him walk in free agency because they're not going to overpay to keep him. And they'd be fine with that more so than trying to mess up the chemistry of this team even if I don't think Tobias is is a big part of the reason why this team is succeeding. So that's kind of where I'm at, but the, 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 the players I think they should be targeting at this deadline. I've gone back and forth on this all season and I'm kind of set in my set in stone here and the team, I think you're going to draft next or, and if you don't, I'll take them when I have a buyer next. I don't think they should be trading for anyone who is going to soak up a lot of on ball possessions Someone who is going to change. Like a lot of people have suggested, Demar Derozan. No, not interested. Uh, Zach Levine, even like I, Zach was someone I've gone back and forth on. I'm out on Zach. Dejounte Murray. I don't want anyone that is going to take the ball away a ton that doesn't fit in the team. I would prefer to go after players who are going to be more complementary pieces. And then if you are getting a guy who's going to be on ball a ton. It needs to be someone who is coming off of the bench as a six man, as a guy who can play with and beat and maxi, but also doesn't need to play with them as well. Someone in the mold of like a Spencer Dinwiddie or someone, someone like that. And then the other guys that I I think I, I'm looking more at like the catch and shoot guys, Bogdan Bogdanovich from the Hawks, who I'm sure we'll talk about at some point during this podcast. Dorian <laughs> Finney Smith from the Nets, another guy that I think could potentially be available. Low usage guys that fit in, won't die on defense, and could provide something for this team. So that's kind of where I'm at with this team. And I kind of think if you're looking at this deadline, it can't be it can't be a, a ch- huge change of the geometry of your team. It has to be guys that can be plugged and played because history shows us you can't change your the way your team plays halfway through the season and win the championship. I think the more talented you are as a team and the better your team is, bizarrely, the more you risk trading for a higher caliber, higher usage player. 
Like, and I, and I think that is something that is when we're talking about teams that are buying at the deadline, you sort of break this up into tiers because there are teams that are that don't have enough, right? Like, I think teams like the Hawks, teams like, um, I don't know, uh, the Kings, um, teams that are kind of in that. I know the Kings were a higher seed last year, but they're not really, you know, in this zone. Some of the Lakers, some of these teams that just don't have the ammo, they are more in these Zach Levine, Donovan Mitchell type roles. A lot of the other teams that we're going to be talking about, we talk about teams like the Sixers where, you know, people want them to make these big moves, but like you're getting all this usage out of Embiid and Maxi and it works really fucking well. Yep. The guys that are important for those type of teams are guys like Derek White who don't have high usage, are efficient, can defend, um, don't take a lot off the table and do some of this extra stuff. And that is what you're looking for when you are a buying as a good team um, most of the time. Now, the team I'm going to pick next is a little bit of a mix because uh, I don't think – based on what you said, I, I don't know if this is who you were thinking. I'm going to select the Miami Heat. Next. Oh, okay. See, I had them on my, my list because uh-huh. no one's really talking about the Heat at all. Yeah. Like, they kind of get mentioned in passing. This is not the team I thought you were going to select. This is the team that kind of gets mentioned in passing, but no one's going deep. They, other than the Sixers, I think they're most likely to be of the Eastern Conference teams that could actually win the conference. Mm -hmm. Like, I think there are four teams that could realistically win the conference as of today. The Celtics, the Bucks, the Sixers, and the Heat. Mm -hmm. And the Heat, I'm giving benefit of the doubt because of the the devil magic and Spoh's advantage and, mm-hmm. and, and Jimmy having crazy playoffs and all that shit. I don't think on paper, they're not, their resume is not that, but no one's really talking about the fact that like they have a ton of expiring salary on their books and they have mm-hmm. a bunch of picks and prospects. And it's just like, they're just never mentioned in these conversations. Yeah. And it's, it's kind of strange because <clears throat> they were kind of the default with a lot of this um, some of the time because the Heat are interesting because their second star <clears throat> is that low usage defense guy in Bam Adebayo. Like, so, um, you know, Jimmy is someone who absorbs a lot of on-ball possessions, but he can also defend and he's also getting older and has hurt a lot. So he's a guy who in theory should be kind of primed to take a little bit of a step back usage wise and be like kind of change who he is and how he plays a little bit. So the Heat are more available for some of these more ball dominant guys who can score, Um, you know, depending on the price. Like I wouldn't be shocked to hear them linked to DeMar DeRozan. Like he's not a perfect fit for them, but he does. I I don't think he would be tremendously expensive. Same thing with Zach Levine, albeit with some different weaknesses. Um, You know, it's about them and kind of what they think they can assimilate into heat culture, but they are a team, um, a guy like Pascal Siakam, even, even with his spacing issues, while he's not a perfect fit with some of the spacing issues they have, um, I think could also get some reps in, um, and kind of take a step back. And I don't think it would totally kill you because bam can shoot some of these twos and does sort of operate in the elbow area and stuff. And I don't think the spacing would be like ghoulish, necessarily so i am I'm, I'm interested in the heat because there are a lot of these big er named guys that are seemingly available for not that expensive and the heat quietly have a decent amount of assets um that they've kind of replenished they have i think all of their own picks yes. they have a uh, red chip to possibly probably not a blue chip but a red chip prospect in Hami Hawkes who's probably pretty interesting. They have Tyler Hero, who's a little bit but they can't trade. They're not allowed to trade Jaime Hawkes. Bill Simmons and Russillo said so on their podcast. Oh, okay. I, thought, to... I thought you were going to like take I'm not RK giving up that really... guy. Yeah. Like, yeah. While they were having a conversation about Donovan Mitchell, you know the one player that could be available that could basically solve all of the issues they've ever had deep into the playoffs? Yeah. yeah. You can't uh, trade Jaime just... Hawkes, though. It's just There's no way. There's simply... It's just un. It's just unworkable. Yeah, I mean, you, you can't you can't give up on a guy who's played well for three months. Uh, like, why would you? What you think? You think the Warriors are going to give up on Andrew Wiggins? 
oh well. <laughs> um, I mean, look, I, I I think like there's other like options, like I, you know, they're I think they're interesting because they're one of these teams that does have a market outside of what the other contenders are going to be looking for. And I think the other teams that are looking for these type of guys, teams like the Knicks, like the um, the Knicks have very strange fit issues that a lot of these guys don't necessarily work well next to Brunson, which is not a problem that the Heat have. And then um, the Lakers just don't have very many assets. So, you know, I, I think that they're kind of in the pole position where if, you know, the Bulls were like, you know what? Maybe we just take a protected first and call it good for Zach's contract, you know, and an expiring. Or That's something the weird like that. thing about the yeah. Levine thing. Like, I know that they played well without him, and mm-hmm. they've. But like, you're telling me that if you just added Zach Levine to the Miami Heat, that he wouldn't. I'm not saying he would solve their problems, but they wouldn't f- figure out some sort of like the fact that they yeah. immediately said they weren't interested in him. The only thing I've ever thought about that is the fact that they know they're getting someone bigger. And yeah. that that person would be Donovan Mitchell. And it doesn't appear as though he's going to become available this season. So maybe they do keep their powder dry. But I, I do think that that could be a missed opportunity. At the very least, I think they should entertain trading. I wouldn't even try to tra- trade Hero. I think Hero has actually been pretty good this year. And I think that any trade where you trade Hero, unless you're attached, unless you're including everything. Yeah. We saw this summer teams didn't want to really jump at the opportunity to take on that contract. It's not like it's going to improve your team to get rid of Tyler Hero and take no. back something else unless you give up a bunch of other stuff in addition to that. So yeah. my my thing is like I don't th- I think it would be a mistake if they didn't look at this opportunity as a chance to maybe not even you, you might even want to approach this similar to the way that the Sixers are, which is we already have our guys that could potentially win a championship on this team and if we are to make the next step we're going to swing big we're not going to take on zach levine who might be the 50 50th best player in the nba right now we want to take on a top 20 guy like donovan mitchell so we're going to wait and we can take that kyle lowry contract attach a first round pick to it and maybe get back a bigger contract or multiple smaller contracts that we can trade a year from now or this off season, if we're in on Donovan Mitchell, like for example, like yeah. if they went to the nets and they were like, give us uh Spencer Dinwiddie and Dorian Finney Smith, and we'll give you Kyle Lowry at a first round pick or whatever, like something mm-hmm. along those lines of let's keep the salary slot open, but also improve our roster a little bit this year. I know Lowry has been playing kind of well for them this year. I highly doubt that Lowry one can stay healthy deep into the playoffs And two is going to have, we saw it with Al Horford and Lowry last year where their legs are just, it was Lowry might've been the year before, but Horford, you know, it's when you get to that age, it's hard to play deep into the playoffs, stay healthy and be 100% throughout the course of a playoff. So I I think they, they should be looking more at if they can't get that Donovan Mitchell type, they should be looking at key role players around the league. Someone that could potentially be available that we've heard is a guy like Bruce Brown who would be just annoyingly Mm -hmm. good for them. That's another guy. Like, just like a good role player who fits well in your team, fits well with the culture, quote unquote, and can keep that salary slot open in case you are in on the bigger fish for this upcoming offseason. Can I I give you one? Another one? Yeah, I want to hear it. Kyle Kyle Lowry um, and some sort of pick arrangement for – Terry Rozier and Cody Martin. Twins, yeah, that would, baby. That would, twins, that, Basil. The, the power of twins. Yeah. See, t- Terry, we talked about Terry last night, and, and there's yeah. a team that I have on my list that I want to save for, for that segment. But yeah, we talked about Terry last night, and the thing with Terry is, like, he's having this crazy year. If he was willing to take a little bit of a backseat, mm-hmm. I think that there's a world where Terry Rozier can be a really good six man on a good team. If he recommits to playing defense, if he doesn't want to have the Jordan pool, Kyle Kuzma role that he has right now, where yeah. he just gets a ton of shots that he can put up numbers and he already got paid. So maybe, maybe he is not someone who 
really desires to be on a good team. He might just be a guy, like, I already did that with the Celtics. Like, I'd rather just get this, you know, I, I'd rather just get, uh, you know, my, my points and, and, and collect my checks and have fun while doing it, even if we're not winning games. That's totally fine. But if there was a team, if it was something like that, like, I think that the Hornets will definitely be open to trading Cody Martin because his con he can't stay healthy. His contract only has one year left after this, so it's not like a toxic contract if he can't stay healthy. You could probably trade it in the future if he can't. And the fact that they've already resuscitated one Martin brother, yeah. try it again. And then you also have, uh, you get an extra shot creator in Terry Rozier to come off your bench and play. I mean, I've literally, someone said a few weeks ago, would anyone care about Tyler Hero if he wasn't white? And I said, well, do you care about Terry Rozier? And they said, no. And then I said, well, there's your answer. Yeah. So, like, he could basically be Tyler Hero off the bench for them when Tyler Hero goes to the bench. Right, exactly. Yeah. Very similar kind of players. So, yeah. <clears throat> so that's, that's kind of how I feel. Like, I think the Heat are in a good position, and I'm shocked that their name hasn't come up more. Well, and I, 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 what I, why I pick them second and why I think they're interesting over the team I assume you're going to pick is because – that team is very good. You know what I'm mm. saying? And I think the Heat are a little bit of an outlier in that they can be more versatile for some of these bigger names that a lot of the other good teams cannot. Yeah. You know, they because can move Heat, up a tier. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. The Heat can move up a tier, but they're also they they have that their infrastructure is so good and they have proven themselves dangerous that they also don't need to feel rushed. You know sure. what I'm saying? They could go into the playoffs like this and everyone would still be scared of them like a lot of their stuff has been like duncan robinson quietly is having like a fucking insane shooting year like they got away with it again like after he like i, I saw a heat i saw a heat yeah. fan tweet earlier and say would you trade duncan robinson for mikhail bridges and then someone let's go and then someone replied and said no duncan robinson is better than utah gordon hayward right now <sighs> You gotta love it. So silly, so silly. I mean, that's what I'm saying. Like, like they, they they've gotten away with it again. Like, so um, every other season, Duncan Robinson sucks. In he's either good in the regular season or the playoffs. Last year, he was yeah. shit in the regular season and good and good in the playoffs. This year, he's good in the regular season. So I'm predicting a absolute disaster class from Duncan Robinson in the playoffs this year. It's every maybe. other year. It's unbelievable. It's the weirdest hope. fucking thing. Yeah, he's yeah. he's so he's such a sicko. So yeah. I I really I'm really uh, interested to see it. But they, but they don't have really their only like negative at this point the way everyone's playing. Really, their only negative salary guy is Lowry, and yeah. that wasn't the case. And he's expiring, so it like doesn't yeah. matter. So they've actually kind of gotten away with it again. You know, like I thought Hero's contract was going to be really bad, but you know. I'm not a hero fine. fan, but it's, you know, it's exactly, it's yeah. been fine. You know, he's so, been, I mean, I think he's yeah. been good this season and yeah. Um, yeah, I, st I still think he might have more difficulties at the higher levels of the playoffs, but honestly, the majority of players do that aren't max yeah. contract players. So, um, yeah. so, okay. So that's the heat wrap. We'll, we'll see what they end up doing. I have a, I kind of have a sneaky feeling that they, they're, they're not going to be too aggressive. I like, I even another wrinkle to that is, if they're able to get Terry Rozier, it makes trading Tyler Hero in a Donovan Mitchell deal so much easier. Because they're yeah. like, hey, we, we literally just have yeah. Tyler Hero at home. Yeah. <laughs> so that's that that's a... We have charismatic Tyler Hero at home. <laughs> we have uh, Tyler Hero with a personality at home. Yes. Um, so... You don't, have to, you don't have to cater to Jack Harlow. Uh... Pituitary Jack Harlow, one of the three. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> that uh, actually should be appropriate transition here. Yeah. Pituitary Jack Harlow really should be Chet Holmgren's name. Yeah. Because uh, he actually, his original name was Pituitary Tyler Hero. So mm -hmm. the Thunder are my team up next. Yeah. And this is, we watched Thunder Celtics last night. We streamed it on playback. Mm -hmm. And... I came into that game feeling like the Thunder were contenders. I left that game feeling like the Thunder were contenders. And this is the team, and I want some people, if you have ideas for people that the Thunder should trade for in the chat, I know we have at least one Thunder fan in here. Mm -hmm. throw, throw some into the chat, because I'm interested to hear who they would be trying to acquire. Because I don't think that Presti is going to be shaking it up too much. 
I think he's going to be looking at this deadline and saying, how can I keep this, this core still together, but how can I make it so that we're matchup proof? Because there are certain players that I think they will have to face in the playoffs, whether it's on the Timberwolves or the Nuggets or one of these teams that have massive players on their team that the Thunder could potentially struggle against on the boards. We saw that at the end of the Celtics game. The Celtics honestly kind of started playing a little bit like the Knicks do when Mitchell Robinson's healthy at the end of last night, crashing the offensive glass, creating extra possessions. And the Thunder started, that's when they really had their comeback during last night's game was that they changed up the strategy. They said, we're just going to crash the glass the whole time. We're going to keep someone near the paint, even though we like to do our spread everything out thing. And it ended up working to the point where I think that as they get further into the playoffs, that's clearly going to be their main issue. Now, we got a few people throwing out names in the chat. I like the Kelly Olenek idea. See, that's the kind of move I think that they should be angling for a move more like that as opposed to like this idea that they need to add another star is not – that's never been the case with this. Like I've always thought they should have been in on – OG Ananobi. I thought they should have been in on the Mikhail Bridges type players. I don't think they need another star. Their stars are in place. Like the way Chet's playing, the way SGA is playing, even the way Jalen Williams is playing. That's what I was going to say is Jalen Williams is kind of an heir yeah. apparent there. You know, like he might, he might be, he might be as good as some of these guys we've got coming up, you know? So yeah. <laughs> Like guys like Kelly Olynyk, who will seamlessly fit into their system on offense and provide them with a little bit more size and front court depth. That's a move that I like. I see a few people also throwing out. Someone said Clint Capella. We I think we discussed him and Jared Allen before. If either of those Capella is more likely to be available than Jared Allen. If either of those guys become available, I don't hate the idea. The only thing is the reason why I like Olynyk for them is because they really emphasize spacing. Kelly's going to provide you with that space. Like his shot chart is crazy. If you look at his shot chart, he shoots from all over the place and he's incredibly efficient from every part of the floor. He can pass. He's someone that will be able to kind of seamlessly fit in with what they want to do. Um, So I think that like, I don't believe that their shooting is as good as their shooting is like, we talked about it last night on stream. They have seven guys shooting over 40% from three this year and Josh Giddy shooting like 36% from three. That's not sustainable throughout the playoffs. They have some guys that I think I can, they can trust. Sure. Isaiah mm-hmm. Joe, uh, Chet Holmgren. Absolutely. But the guys that are shooting like way above their heads, that's not something that I would fully buy into. And yes, Olenek shooting is a little bit overrated as a three point shooter, but he has had seasons where he ups the volume and the percentages come down a little bit, but in that system where the spacing is just completely perfect, I think that he should absolutely be one of the guys towards the top of their list. If they're making a trade at this deadline. So the one I like, somebody said this in the <clears throat> comments and it was one of the ones I was thinking of um, Clint Capella got thrown out in, yeah, the, yeah, that in was, the comments. Yeah. We talked about him. That's a, that's one that I really like for them because I think that a lot of these other guys, like I like Kelly Olenek for them um, and just in terms of not breaking their identity, but I do think that they kind of like the Celtics, they, they have a, they, the Celtics and the Thunder have a little bit of the uh, Spider-Man meme when we were like watching that game last night, like right down to like Porzingis and Chet kind of staring each other down as pituitary gland Jack Harlow like copies. So I, I think that yeah, uh, but for for Porzingis he would be more to it pituitary gland young lean. Anyway, <laughs> there we go. There we go. I'm trying um, to think of someone from that region of the world. Yeah. Um, so you know, I, I think that Capella gives you a little bit more burliness. You know what I'm saying? I think that's what they need is they need someone who's burly, playoff proven, and like will give you an extra dimension of size so you can move up. So you aren't stuck in these Jalen Williams at the four lineups um, that you've been running. I think it's good to have them, but I think, you know, you don't even necessarily need to start Capella. Like you can bring Capella off the bench, but. um, Do you know how many rebounds Clint Capella had in this last game? No, how many? 
17. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Like, he's a, he's a monster. Like, he's like the... And, and we know that, like, we know... And I mean, maybe it's just Presti leaning into what he could get, but we've seen him lean into these rebounding teams in the past. You know what I'm saying? It's not like this is something that's totally foreign to him. I mean, maybe... Dagnall like has said, I don't really want to play with it like that, but I think that that it makes sense for a lot of reasons. Um, I'm just going to say Bertans for Capella just straight up works and you would get a Bertans trade exception <laughs> if you made this trade because of the 23,000, because of the John Collins uh, TP. So you would get the $17 million Davis Bertans um, TP like, and you, you, the the and the Thunder have three draft picks um coming up, Mi- probably two because the they Jazz are se- probably because they have seventy. Yeah, I know the the Jazz yeah. is what top ten protected top and those 10 like protected. Yeah. yeah, yeah, So and, probably two, but like you can't even roster like even if you like wave Poku and you've got you like you've got a lot of guys who are interesting. You know what I'm saying? So like even adding one rostered guy, even after like cutting poku you you're quickly getting to like cutting trey man or aaron wiggins man like yeah that's it's that's tough. Where, like that, that's where i think that i i do wonder if they end up because they want to save their ammo for potentially a bigger move for someone they want later similar to the heat that they may they might look at the clint capella contract and say look we don't need to play clint capella a ton we yeah. just need we just need a guy who like i said can make us match up proof and exactly. matchup proof yeah. is the thing. The only thing left from this team is that to me. Yes, is like, exactly. Yep. Is like the fact that they could run into a weird matchup in the playoffs. And look, maybe this is like you said on stream last night. Maybe this is the uh, the 2014 Golden State Warriors, and we just haven't caught up yet. But yeah. history has shown the deeper you get into the playoffs the more size does matter. Like it, it's, you can't completely throw that out the window for every single matchup. Like it even caught up to the Warriors last year in the Lakers matchup. They were just getting yeah. absolutely destroyed despite in theory, having a better team. So I, 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 I'm looking at the click Capella contract and I forgot that he only has one year left on this deal. So that, exactly. yeah. that's where it becomes interesting to me because you keep the, the salary slot rolled over mm-hmm. and that if it doesn't work, trade him in the off season, trade him at next deadline. It doesn't really matter. Like there's z- basically zero risk involved and you're going to have to trade the, uh, some of these picks at some point anyway. So if, if he's available for Bertans and a first round pick, and then maybe they take a flyer on one of your younger guys that you don't want, yeah. then everything works perfect. And you can totally get away with that. So I, I, I actually do like the Clint Capella fit there more now that I think about it, just for that reason. But yeah. um, we'll see. We'll see what Presti does. I, I, I have a feeling he, he had a statement before the season. I didn't see this until someone put up on Twitter today. But it was, uh, it was a comment from uh, Presti before the season where he said, "Oh, I'm sorry. This was last year when they were talking about making a push for the playoffs." And he says, "I don't want it to be an appearance. I want it to be an arrival." So basically what he was trying to say was uh, if we're getting to the playoffs, we want to make some noise. And I think if they are able to make real moves this deadline and they don't see it compromising their long-term vision, they will do it. They're, they shouldn't make a trade just to make a trade. They're good enough to make it to the at least the conference finals right now. I said going into last night, look, look at their – they've already they, – they kicked the shit out of the Wolves. They beat the Thunder t- – or they beat the Nuggets twice – yeah. They beat the Celtics. They didn't beat the Sixers, <laughs> but they hung with the Sixers all the way till the end. And honestly, they probably should have won that game. And I think that all uh, they had like a terrible shooting game, if I remember correctly. They, they're a team that I think it, it j- is just like one minor move like that away from making some real, real noise. So they, they are, they're kind of in their Mark Gasol. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, like they're in that 2019 Raptors space. Where, yes. Like, it's worth making the Marc Gasol move, you know? Like, so, and the thing, that's, I guess just that's the thing with the Thunder is it doesn't, there's literally no risk with the amount of first round picks you have. Like, mm-hmm. you quite literally have to trade some of these because otherwise you will just be waiving your first round picks for no benefit. 
whatsoever. Well, they're already going to start to like Poku will probably get dumped. Trey yes. Mann will probably get waived or dumped at some point. And those were guys that they took in 2020 and 2021. But because as we've discussed before, they have so many picks. It doesn't even, it's not even a dent in the armor. Like they're like, yeah. whatever we move on. We hit on Jalen Williams. Uh, and maybe, maybe Usman Jang isn't anything, but we hit on Jalen Williams. So that's all that matters. We hit on Chet. That's all that matters. So yeah. they're able to just constantly replenish and move to the next, uh, to the next thing. By the way, I already fucked this draft up by the way. Cause I realized I took a buyer uh again when i should have taken a seller there so so i'll do a buyer and then we'll go to sell yes that's fair that? yeah yeah i already fucked uh, up the draft that i came up with the idea for yeah. <laughs> um so this is where it gets tricky because i think those are the three clear buyers and i had a little bit of i had a little bit of trouble after this just because i think there are a bunch of teams that can kind of go either way um a little bit so I, where I ended up landing on this is I will say, I, I'm going to say the Orlando Magic are my next pick. There was one other team on I list. considered here. There was one other team I considered here, but I think the Magic are a way, 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 they're in a position like kind of where I expected the Thunder to be coming into this season where they're clearly very good. I'm pretty sure they're not going to be in the play in. Like maybe they catch some bad luck or some injuries or something like that. But I think they're, they could, gen be. They could, could be, be, but like, I, I don't know. Uh, they, all right. They're currently t the, the Knicks are one game behind them and the Knicks are in the play in. The, yeah. the, 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 and I think the Knicks are going to be regular season wise. I think this OG and Anobi move. Look, they did lose Mitchell Robinson and quickly was important to them. But I think just taking RJ Barrett and turning him into OG and Anobi is going to. They'll go on a little bit of a run. The the Magic have the same benefit the Heat do of playing in the Mickey the most Mickey Mouse division in the NBA. And, they do, yeah. yeah. Um, and they also, I also I know we disagree on this, but I also just don't think the Pacers are. I think the Pacers are going to continue to fade as the season goes along, and I think that the Pacers might even let go of the rope if they like drop into like the nine ten range. Like, like I think they they might look around and go like, eh. They might be. They might have the, the same decision the Raptors had, you know, two years ago, where it's like, you know, no, their ninety-seven thousand-year-old owner is going to die soon, so they got to make it to the play. And, yeah, oh, Herb Simon's going to drop well, dead in a few months, so we got to make. You know, he's dreamed his whole life of getting to the play, I, and that just ex started existing four years ago. When I got the news flash about Herb Cole dying, I thought it was Herb Simon at first. And I was like, ah, oh, man, the Pacers can finally wait. Um, but no, uh, you know, I, I think I I'm, I still kind of think that the Pacers will drop out. I, but I, I believe in the Magic as a team that I think will, one way or another, be in the playoffs. Um, barring horrendous luck in the regular season and horrendous. I think they're pretty clearly at least one of the top eight teams in the NBA. I'm or sorry, the Eastern Conference, and I'm pretty sure I I, li I like them on a tier with the Heat. Guys, um, guys, real quick, can you don't. Google what the Magic's record is against the Celtics over the last two years? <laughs> just say, 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 I'm just laughing. Sam's like, the Heat are contenders. The mm -hmm. Magic are a real playoff threat. Right, exactly. Every and time I watch the Magic, now contenders they so good. They yeah. <laughs> yeah, the Magic. <laughs> I believe in the Thunder now. No, no, you're right. To, to be clear, the, yeah, I think the Magic are good, and I think it's just very obvious what they need, right? Yeah, they need a guard. They need a, a, they, they need a guard, guard who can shoot. Yes, yes, <laughs> like, like, or at least Jerry Trent. Yeah, come sure. on down. Yeah, yeah, like you know what I'm saying. So someone like that. I mean, obviously Simons would be incredible. I don't think they're he's going to be traded this yeah. deadline barring something insane. And like, you know, they've got a lot of, you know, guys like they, they, they low key have a pretty decent amount of assets. They do have so much of this stuff that can go out and they, you know, do have these contracts. Like I think Suggs coming along is pretty good. Yep. Shout out to Nikki's coast who points out that I'm looking for a different kind of Florida girlfriend. Um, we're getting Disney, Disney uh, women, we're, we're back. Um, I will go to yeah, Epcot Sam, with you. Sam Sam only yeah. co-signs teams if uh, he he looks up their demographics before we record, and he sees the yeah. uh, the number of single women in the greater yes. Orlando area. Yes. I love the magic. 
<laughs> I've been to Orlando, man. Yeah, it's yeah. fun. Yeah. Like I love yeah. it. Sam's um, gonna be in on in on the Raptor soon, and you'll know why. Anyway, continue. Yeah. But everyone's you know everyone's saying in the comment. I'm seeing Terry Rozier. I'm seeing Malcolm Brogdon. You know, like these guys are like stop guy. You know what I'm saying? Like competent yes. guard play. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not going to like really win anything, but like, I think it's a successful season for the magic if they win a playoff series for sure. And probably a successful season if they, you know, if they mm -hmm. end up in a dog fight with one of these like real Top teams. teams. Yeah. yeah. Like, like I, that's totally fine. You know? And I think that you, I think they could put a real scare on some of these teams. Um, I think I usually, just Celtics and bucks. Like I usually think when bills like, you got to get guys playoff experience early. It's a bit overrated only because you don't know what kind of player they could potentially become. And there, and a lot of the times when guys get early playoff experience, yes, they can learn from it. They can grow from it, whatever. But I, I, I think that in general is a little bit overrated. I changed my, I, I changed my mind about certain teams because I think the magic are competent guard play away from being a force in the Eastern conference. Like yeah. I think Pons and Franz and Paulo are clearly the kind of players that are going to probably get better in the playoffs and they'll have a, a clear advantage because similar to the Celtics, even before they were the, this version of the Celtics, they had the positional advantage of having two of their best young players being wings, having a ton of spacing, all that stuff. The weird thing about Orlando this year is that Wendell Carter's low key having a terrible season. So that's what I was gonna say. Is quietly they could actually use competent big play, and that yeah. stands out when you see that Gogo Bataze is like kind of a huge part of their team. You know, yeah. and he's had a great season, but like, sure, that's a little bit. Of, how much? That's how much a little do bit you of trust? a red flag. Exactly. Yeah. Like, yeah. like Wendell was supposed to be the guy for them, and. Right. Wendell playing and and look maybe some of its injuries and the fact that he can't stay on the court but like I've been, let's just say to use a Zach term I've been very whelmed watching yes. uh yeah. not overwhelmed not underwhelmed I've just been whelmed watching Wendell Carter this season so you would hope Kevin that is that is celebrating right now oh Kevin my god I know bumping. Kevin yeah. is running around I was right well Listen, I know your Bulls still traded the Franz pick in that. In that trade, <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say was, the real, beating, the real, not beating yeah, the allegations. Also, however, wrong, and you were wrong about Dan, Daniel Gafford. You can he can have the Carter win, but he's wrong about Daniel Gafford. I'm sorry. I uh, I just want to say that I was I was very high on Franz coming into this year. I thought he was going to make yeah. All NBA. I think he's still got a shot at the All Star team, although they'll probably lean towards Paulo because he was the number one pick in the draft if the Magic do get a representative in the All-Star game. Sure. Paul, Franz has been great this year, but his shooting is way down uh, in terms of his three-point shooting in general. He's just having a bad shooting year. Yeah. If he can turn that around, he can definitely be... Like, he's their best player right now. Like, I think long-term, yeah. Paulo's got a shot to be better, but Franz is their best player right now. And... I I just want to see Franz and Paulo with better spacing around them. And I, look, Anthony Black, he shot way above my expectations for them. He's still not a good shooter. He's not anyone that is going to get respect as a shooter. Fultz is expiring. You can move on from him. I even think, like you said, like people have said like Rogier, Brogdon, whatever. I yeah. even think if your goal is to like not take Franz and Paulo off the ball, and you want to see what they can do on the ball in the playoffs, just add like a buddy healed. Like, yeah, like, sure. like try to get buddy and like, just try to get someone who's just going to put up a ton of threes off the ball. And in that you'll get a better idea of what you need to, because he's expiring. He's someone who's on the trade block and, and you could do faults and maybe some seconds and try to steal buddy healed if he gets traded or whatever. So, or and I think Gary Trent is someone that you brought up earlier, those kind of guys that are just like, going to be willing shooters off of the ball to see what you can really get. The the other, before we move on, this is actually a good transition to my first seller pick here, which is uh, our friend uh, Magic Vagberg, a.k.a. Jess Vagberg on Twitter. The Magic are the fourth worst pick and roll team in the NBA this season. The only teams worse are the Utah Jazz, the Toronto Raptors, and the Portland Trailblazers. They're averaging 0.8 points per possession on um, on pick and rolls this season. And the best 
pick and roll scorer so far this year, or I'm sorry, not even pick and roll, pick and roll operator this year, has actually been friend of mine, Tyus Jones. So that's someone if you want another stopgap guy, just as like a guy who can run a basic pick and roll. I would prefer to get the spacers more so than Tyus. But if you wanted to go in that direction, you could you could go after a boring backup point guard too, and that would probably impl- improve their offense just because they have literally no one who can do that. And Fultz, just because of the shooting, is just such a clunky fit with Franz yeah. and Paulo that I don't believe in in his ability to kind of be that guy. So, um, okay, so for my first seller, I'm gonna go with the Wizards. Let's I know go. that a lot of people have. I, I know that people that are pick, gonna want me to pick. Okay, I have because I yeah. have a list here. A lot of yeah. people are gonna want me to pick more interesting uh, teams, and I have a few written down here. But the thing with the Wizards is, I think they have a unique opportunity. Every every player on their team should be is basically available except for Bilal Kulabali, to my knowledge. Yes, yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think that they're pretty much in a unique position where there are no sellers. And there is a large chunk of players on that team that could be available. And a ton of them are expiring too. So it's not like you're taking a huge risk on taking on contracts, except for Kuzma and Poole who are, who are locked up long-term. And then Denny Avdia just signed his contract extension, uh, which makes him a little bit trickier to trade. But I think the two guys that they'd probably be like, you really got to blow us away with your offer to trade uh, that they wouldn't trade Bilal in general. And then the other guy, you probably really have to like give them something legit to get Denny Avdia. But there, did you see the report yesterday from that guy, Brett Siegel, who was like two first round picks for Kyle Kuzma is what the wizards want. And I'm like, they're not first off. They're not getting two first round picks for Kyle Kuzma. Second, if Kyle Kuzma were to become available, I think that they would do it for they they would trade anyone on their roster except for Bilal for two first round picks. Like there isn't yeah, anyone yeah. that they would ever turn down that offer for. Like that's as long as they're not super fake first round picks. Yeah, I was gonna say they're they're a, they're also a uniquely untalented team, which is kind of funny. What, what's yeah. what's interesting is that the the only thing about the Wizards that kind of made me pause about. Taking, I ended up saying they would be number one because of the reason you just laid out. But the the only thing is that they don't have a ton of guys who are super useful to contenders, which is the problem in terms of their guys that they're selling. Like the their fourth best three point shooter of the guys who play like real minutes is Landry Shamit, and he's shooting thirty six percent. Like you know, like this year, which is. It's not great, you know, like Bilal, who they're not trading. And then Tyus Jones is small and can't play in the playoffs. Yeah. So then then you're stuck with like Corey Kispert and some of these other guys. And if you like Daniel get, Gafford, let, let's just go down yeah. the list of guys that they could potentially trade at this deadline and would yeah. actually have interest on other teams. Daniel Gafford, Tyus yeah. Jones. Yeah. Maybe Kyle Kuzma. I, I'm not sure. Maybe. Uh, DeLon Corey Wright Kispert. The, DeLon yeah, Wright. Like, yeah. Like th- these are guys that I don't think that they're going to get you all. They're not all going to get you first round picks. Could you get, uh, could you take a flyer on a young player in some of these trades that you might be interested in more? Cause they didn't draft any of these guys. The only ones that they drafted were Bilal. He's the only one they've drafted. And, and uh, Oh, this, this, this regime you mean? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. This front yeah. office has only drafted him mm-hmm. and, I look at the market for most of these guys, and I think I think Kispert might be able to get you a first round pick, like a pretty that's, protected first round pick. That's the one and I, I would... think a team like the Magic could should definitely be interested in that as like their yes. version of a Duncan Robinson type. Right. And I know that shooting maybe got a little bit overrated and overpaid, just guys that are like individual shooters. Kispert might he's bigger, he might be able to hold up on defense in the playoffs a little bit better than some of these guys that generally get traded uh, that are shooters. And then also I think he's, he, he can, he's not a great passer, but he can make the extra pass, which is really all you need on most of these teams. He's going to be playing up stars. If he gets traded anyway, he's someone I'm really interested to see if he does get traded. If he has a market, Denny's another one that provide he, he requires more of like a specific context where like the warriors or like uh, the Pacers or a team that has a ton of shooting and movement could probably use him. 
but he doesn't fit on every team because he has his own shooting concerns. But there are like a lot of guys on that team that are at least rotation players on good teams. Like I think Delon is someone that a lot of teams will be interested in. You'll probably only get seconds back, but you'll start stacking the seconds. You'll start stacking potentially young prospects. And for the guys like Kuzma, maybe if you get like a, and Kisper and then Denny, you can maybe get first for them. And then maybe, maybe like a heavily protected fake kind of first for a Tyus Jones is, is, is on the table. Uh, as we look at this deadline. So I think they can kind of go, like they could fully blow this up because it's obviously not going anywhere and start to really stack up picks because they, they're they not like super pick positive. They have one extra pick, I think, that they got and it's basically a fake first that they took on in the Chris Paul trade. And then they have like swaps from the Suns, but they really don't have a ton of picks that I think this could be their starting point. So, yeah. For sure, yeah, and I, I just don't think they, I, 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 you know, they're they're gonna have guys available, and like the other thing about this Wizards front office is they have not stopped underwhelming returns from them making moves. Yep. You know what I'm saying? Like they did pretty well in the Bradley Beal trade, but like that was a, at the time there were certain corners of the internet that were like seconds just seconds you know yeah, yeah like, like you know like and i mean the, the Tyus Jones, Jones, that's a disaster if it if i know that it was a specific context because he was expiring that night yeah. and they had to right. figure out a deal but like right. trading porzingis for tyus jones on its face you're almost better off just letting him expire <laughs> like yeah. it really i'm sure they did it as a favor to an agent but it's just it is just funny that yeah. like you they watch got, Porzingis got on the Celtics, strong. you're like he's they like a top twenty strong. player this season. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. That I mean, like you said, that was like more than it was. It was more of like they a. By the way, they didn't trade. get a first round pick in that trade. You know that, right? No, they had to have because we only nope. got one of the first round picks from the. You got two of the first round picks from the from the Grizzlies. You traded back a ton, and then you had the extra one you traded for Drew Holiday. They didn't even get a true. first. That's crazy. Yeah, that is that's crazy. why. That's why I'm yeah. saying like they treated a top twenty player for Tyus Jones basically, and then also yeah. Danilo Gallinari well, and Mike Muscala make the money work. Well, it's it's the Jimmy Butler return, right? Where it's it's essentially a sign and trade. Like yes, yeah, you know, like w- w- like it's not like they really did that. You know what I'm saying? Like it's yeah. it's like saying the every team is designed to make the Heat and the Celtics better. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> well, but. I'm saying, like, you know, like it's how the Cavs technically traded LeBron James for a first round pick to the Heat. Sure. I, I, you know, like, yeah, I'm saying yeah. I understand they traded right. a top 20 player for Tyus Jones at the end of the day. Yeah, that's, true. <laughs> like, that's true. Like, that, that is the reality of the situation. The way that right. Porzingis has played this year has been way above my expectations. I can't right. say I, I was sitting here praising the trade at the time, but right. the reality of the situation now that we're looking back at it is that. So it is kind of crazy to look at it like that. The only other player on this team, like Kuzma is the only one that's really interesting to me if they actually do move him. My gut feeling is that they wait to trade that contract until the offseason. It goes down in price and it gets easier to move this offseason. Mm-hmm. I've said on here before, I don't think it's a bad contract. He's basically making fringe starter. After this season and next season, he's basically making fringe starter high-level bench player money. Yep. A lot of Sixers fans have asked me, could we trade for Kuzma? I'm in on the idea because I think that I actually think that Kuzma, if you were to trade Tobias Harris or lose Tobias Harris this offseason, I think Kuzma is basically a facsimile for Tobias Harris in terms of he's going to get you buckets. He's at least passable on defense. Um, They're they're kind of different versions of the same player. Um. And a lot of people keep bringing up the fact that Kuzma was on the Lakers and won the championship. He was like the seventh man on that Lakers team. He's He would be a starter on the current version of the Sixers. And I think that I, I'm kind of split on the idea in general. I would like the fact that he's a positive rebounder. I think he's he can kind of pass. But has he, has he got to the point where he would prefer doing that role as a fourth or fifth option, maybe even a third option on a team like the Sixers, as opposed to what he's doing in Washington now. Because as Will's pointed out, he's gotten the star shot diet. And look, it hasn't they haven't won games, but once again, maybe he doesn't care about that. Maybe he just prefers to do that. So I'm kind of at the point where I would be surprised if they made the move. 
I wouldn't be opposed to it. I think that he definitely has potential to be a guy that shines better in a different situation. He's a willing catch and shoot guy. He will attack closeouts. He can make, he's actually kind of an underrated passer. Like he can move the ball a little bit, but I, I do worry about that archetype of player that has gotten the taste of what it's like to be a star on his own team and then has to immediately change his role on another team and then fit in. It has to be more of an Andrew Wiggins, Aaron Gordon situation to me where they haven't filled that role on their current team. And they, like, I don't think Kuzma views what's happening in Washington right now as a failure. He was clowning the Pistons the other night on Twitter and they have like two more wins than the Pistons. Like, mm. I don't really think he cares. So anyway. Yeah, exactly. So, um, All right. I'll take my second pick now. And I will sellers. move on for my sellers. I will take the uh, the other top tier seller team. I had these two in a little tier um, of seller. And I will pick the Utah Jazz, who I think okay. are the other obvious seller at this deadline. Um. They are essentially the same as the Wizards with the exception that they have two or three very good players and keepers, and then the rest of their team is actually just better than all of the Wizards players. <laughs> so they're like a super version of the Wizards, and you have the rat bastard Danny Ainge um, overseeing it, who is a demon um, and has no problem trading any of these guys. So we've already brought up Kelly Olynyk. Um, Jordan Clarkson and Colin Sexton, varying versions of a pretty similar player that are going to be available. Um, if anyone is interested in John Collins, you can certainly get him. <laughs> um, you know, Taylor Horton Tucker, again, if you're interested in him, I'm certain you can get him. Um, and, and they just have, you know, all, pretty much all of their vets are available at any price. And then Markinen being the clear you know, if you want to make a King's Ransom offer, um, you know, see if the, the rat bastard Danny Ainge will let you have him um, for some god-awful, you know, trade package that everyone I like, will pay you for. I like that after every team is like, like when there's rumors about a player, yeah, most GMs will put out a smoke signal and be like, hey, we're not trading this player. That player's really good. Like the Nets just did it with Mikhail Bridges today, right? Like yeah. Woj said, like they're gonna build around him, whatever. Danny Ainge is his response was like, We're not trading him unless <laughs> <laughs> yeah. he like if, looked if, he looked directly in the into the camera like Frank Underwood in House of Cards yeah. when that when, when, when they did the No, no, no. We would never trade Lowry Markinen. Of course, if I were to trade Lowry Markman, <laughs> I would get a full first round picks and get that man fired. But he don't know that now, do he? <laughs> <laughs> like that that is like exactly Danny Ainge. Danny Ainge is the Mormon version of yeah. that. Yeah. Um, yeah, maybe he'll maybe he really will trade for Josh Giddy. Now that he's like Frank <laughs> Underwood. <laughs> <laughs> Well, why did they invite the royal family to sit courtside at the Jazz game? That's so weird. Prince Andrew, what are you doing here? Woo, crazy. It's a, it's a big week. It's a big week for, for a lot of things related to this. So yeah. Just dropping. yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh. The NBA can't escape. Can't escape. The long shadow being cast. You know what's really weird is maybe this is flirting versus harassment because the Wizards just have a ton of expiring mm -hmm. contracts and the Jazz don't. Because the Jazz's only expiring guys are like Taylor Horton Tucker and Kelly Olynyk, right? Yeah. The rest of those guys. Everybody else has those like three year contracts. Right, that's what I'm Martin saying. Is like, two, yeah. Olinick is the guy that if I were a team, like I said, like the Thunder, or the Sixers, I would love Kelly Olinick on the Sixers. Would would be a great way to upgrade a team and take a low risk because he's an expiring contract. Yeah. The other guys, it's like, do you really want to take on John Collins? Do you really want to take on? Uh, well, Taylor Horton Tucker is expiring, I think. Yeah. Or has an unguaranteed next year. Yeah, but like, he's expiring. He's just straight up expiring. I don't want I Sexton. Him. I don't want Clarkson, really. Like, what teams yeah. would those guys help is my question here. If, if anyone can I, think of one, then I'm open to the idea. I know Bill said uh, Clarkson to the Knicks. I wouldn't do that if I were the Knicks. I, I would 
be more interested in like a Terry Rozier than I would be in, or a Malcolm Brogdon if I'm the Knicks than I would be in a Jordan Clarkson. Well, I think I think that's the plan is you undersell, you know what I'm saying? Some of these guys is like two second round picks instead of like a first, you know what I'm right. saying? Right. So you're or, like some okay, of these other you, guys. Yeah. You don't want to give up a first to get Rozier or Brogdon. Right. Then we have yeah. Clarkson who is Yeah, like, we've got Clarkson at home. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. We've got Colin yeah. Sexton at home. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Like that's the that that's kind of his role. I think Olinick, I would be willing to give up a first for Olinick if I were a contender. Um, which I maybe sounds crazy to some people, but like I said this before when we did our what's what you asked us who what are one trade for contenders, one guy for contenders, and I said Kelly Olinick. Like that that's kind of the reason why. Um he's and 32. I, I, he's 32. He's, yeah, he's 32. But he's getting up he also there. came into the league when I think he was 21 when he came in or 22. So he's like a 10 year player. Um, and he also went through the Miami heat, like machine. He'll be 33 by the time years. the playoffs come around. So you are, you are taking, you, you're hoping that his game it, it ages well, to be fair, the archetype of player like him, their games almost always age well. Like yeah. he can shoot, he can pass, he can do things that most bigs can't do. Um, and those players generally age better than guys who are like hyper reliable. Like I- I've said before on here, like I don't think Tobias Harris is going to age well because I just don't. I don't think that he has the skill. Like, he plays a-, a bully ball style, doesn't have crazy feel, doesn't have crazy uh, uh, athleticism or anything. And I think that that kind of player tends to age poorly. But like we see with guys, I'm not comparing him to. Uh, like an Al Horford level of player. He didn't have that level of career, but like Horford has aged very well because he's just turned into basically a spot up shooter who can make yeah. the extra pass on offense. And there's a world where that could be, he could be a lesser version of that. Uh, look, look, at what, team. look at what buyout Kevin Love did for the Heat. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. Like, and, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, yeah, this is something like that. Like, where yeah. just a guy who can, like, all he does, all, all he do is. Uh, hit outlet passes, shoot threes, and eat hot chip in line. You know, like, <laughs> that's that's the like w- what you're looking for. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, but I, I think the Jazz are going to make everyone available. Um, I think the difference is I think Winger will be like, yeah, two seconds, fuck it, let's do Daniel Gafford trade. I think Danny Ainge, the rat bastard, will be like, no, 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 Colin Sexton. Hmm. You want two first for Colin Sexton, right? Like, you know, I, I think there's going to be Second. a lot of the Danny Ainge. Well, but no, I think Danny Ainge is going to say, well, we were so close to trading. Colin oh, okay. Sexton. So you're saying, like, yeah. 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 I, I think, I think the Jazz are going to trade Olinick. I think they're going to trade. Um, I think they'll sniff around Laurie Markinen if somebody comes with a very interesting offer, but I think they're ultimately going to stand pat with the rest of these guys. Cause yeah, I, I think so too. I don't think, I don't think they're going to have a lot of trade. Value, so. I think they're open for business. Let's just say yes. that much though. Yes. Both of these teams are very open for business. And yes. all right. So I'll go with another seller since we did four buyers up top and I'll yeah. go with, let's talk about the nets. Okay. Because this is a team that should probably be selling more so than they already are willing to <laughs> they, mm-hmm. yeah. they're probably a team that should say no one on this roster is off limits for the right like they should be doing the danny age thing to be completely honest because yeah. i know that they don't have their own picks and that changes the cal- calculus a little bit but if like will had suggested over the off season if they had done a potential trade where they traded like bridges for simons and scoot like he wanted to or they explored different trades where they traded off role players and got back picks and young guys uh, that had more high upside uh, than the players that they currently have on their roster. They could still compete. I don't think they would be winning as many games as they would be, and they'd probably end up giving a top 10 pick to the Rockets. But hey, they're probably going to do that anyway. Because in the NBA, you can't have Mikhail Bridges as your best player and expect to be a top six seed or even maybe even a play play in team because since they made that trade where they traded kevin durant and kyrie irving the week of the trade deadline i think there are like 15 games or like 10 games below 500 10 to 15 games below 500 they're lucky to even be kind of where they are right now they they Mm -hmm. had a horrible game last night against the pelicans they have no offensive engine on that team. They basically just have the, the, they're the Utah Jazz of last year, essentially, where like they just have yeah. a ton of a lot, a lot of talent, 
none of it none of it really makes all that much sense without a a, a direction to pick and like mm-hmm. to go in like be like all right we we like for example like i think that they'll probably be in on donovan mitchell if he's available this offseason i would prefer to see them either do that or really sell off a lot of the uh talent that they currently have and make more of a I don't even want to say rebuild because like, I think you could stay competitive and get back like good players plus picks yeah, and still have what Joe Sai wants, but with a better long-term outcome uh, potential, if you get higher upside picks or you get young players that could potentially really go crazy for you. Can, can I say something I sneaky didn't like put together about this Nets team? Like when I was kind of considering them as sellers, because I always, everyone thinks about like, you know, Dinwiddie, Dorian Finney-Smith, um, uh, uh, Royce O'Neal, you know, those guys, uh, when you're talking about guys who would be available for them to trade for, obviously Ben Simmons. Those guys are all older. Something I, I didn't realize, both Cam Johnson and Mikhail Bridges are 27. That's the thing. They're not a yeah. young team. Right. Their like, young players are like 30. <laughs> yeah. Like, like those guys are going to be 30. Like if it takes you two years to turn this thing around, and that's probably about what it's going to take, unless you like really hit a splash in free agency, like those guys might start decline. Like it's possible those guys start declining. Like probably not. Most guys' primes run through like thirty-two at this point, like extended primes. You know, especially like, good shooters like them. Good shooters and those guys. Yeah, like it's, it's, you'll, you'll probably be fine with those guys, but like the clock is kind of fucking ticking. You know, like it's not the same as like. Um, I think what Claxton's twenty four, like Claxton's the, by far their best young player. Yeah, he's from. Yeah, and then my my guy Cam Thomas, who's kind of been shit recently, but yeah, yeah. Well, that's what I'm saying. Like you've got like, but like you know, like there, there's like probably about the same difference between like Nick Claxton in terms of like age as like him and like Noah Clowney and Derek Whitehead as there is like between him and Cam Thomas. You know, so like there's kind of tears to this. You know what I'm saying? Like obviously you want to trade the older guys, but like. If the right trade's available and you can get a pretty good return and this is the kind of trade deadline, again, there's not going to be that many sellers. We just went through the top two and explained that, like, there's not really good players on those top two teams that are going to be looking to sell. And you can kind of start a bidding war for Cam Johnson or Mikhail Bridges, like, Worth looking into, like you know. I know every I know every Sixers fan's going to want Mikhail Bridges. Um, and by the way. Will did also point out that yeah. this is what they said before they didn't trade. Ky- they said they weren't trading Kyrie or KD. They said yeah. they weren't trading Harden, and then they did it. So I don't think that that report from Woj really means that much. I still think that if they got the Godfather offer for Mikhail Bridges or Camp Johnson, especially, they would definitely entertain it. Mm-hmm. I know Sixers fans are going to want, because I tweeted today, like, right the wrong for trading Mikael Bridges and trying to trade for him, blah, blah, blah. I would be surprised if Mikael Bridges gets traded at this deadline. I think that that's the one guy that they really want to hang on to in addition to Claxton and then try to acquire Donovan Mitchell. I think that's been their vision, and they'll at least hold on to that until Donovan Mitchell probably gets traded to the Miami Heat this offseason if he doesn't go to Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. If the Sixers were to offer all three first-round picks they can trade right now, an unprotected Clippers pick, an unprotected Sixers pick, and by the way, another wrinkle in this is that the Sixers have, the Nets have the Sixers 2027 first-round pick right now. So you could remove the protections from that and add more value to the trade. So you could basically, if you really wanted to, if you're the Sixers, you can send them both the picks you got in the Harden trade, you could send them a far, far out first round pick unprotected and you could send them uh, and remove the protections from that pick for Mikael Bridges at this deadline. And honestly, if they didn't really care about like competing and they just wanted those picks, you probably could say, and if they wanted to compete, you could make an offer where, you know, they either get Tobias, maybe they don't want to take on Tobias, but they've been interested in him in the past, Melton, whoever. There are offers around this, but I I would be shocked if Maury were ever, ever to do this. But there are offers that are out there, I think, from competing teams that could be very pick-heavy and juicy 
They turned one down from the Grizzlies last uh, last deadline, and I think they'd probably do the same now. But how many picks is it before you say, shit, they're offering this much for Mikael Bridges? And you do the Danny Ainge thing that he's done with Laurie Market, and which is basically like, hell, we're not going to turn down something that's like that. Like the upside of those picks is crazy. Like you would yeah. be insane to turn down a Clippers pick that's five years away and multiple unprotected Sixers picks that are five years away. Well, especially because the thing about the thing about Brooklyn as like a team and the Knicks never take advantage of this. This is why they're insane and the Heat understand this and some of the, like the Lakers have in the past. Like when you're a destination market, one of those one of the you know two LA or New York teams or Miami, like cap piece is actually valuable to you. Yeah. So like you can take these expiring contracts and you can probably get someone pretty fucking good. Like yeah. in addition to your like big draft picks, like at the very least you can get a lot of credit with agents, like throwing, you know, uh, good young players, a, a maximum poison pill or something. And like making someone match for these like sub all-star level guys or something like that. So like, I don't think it like I don't even think you're going to be necessarily be rebuilding very much. I mean, hell, Marks rebuilt a pretty good young team with literally two first round picks in like five yeah. years but, and, like, that were bad. And I do, yeah, Levert yeah. and and Jared Allen, who actually ended yeah. up being fantastic value picks for where they were picked. Yeah, he's done a good job with that in the past. I do just want to say I see people in the comments saying this. Memphis was the offer last year. The the rumor was they offered four first round picks. Okay. One of those picks was the pick they traded for Marcus Smart that they got from the Warriors. So that first round pick, no one expected that first round pick to have as much value as it does right now. So that was one of the picks. I'm assuming the other one was their first round pick that they traded to the Celtics, that the Celtics traded back a ton of times. That was always going to be a late first. So there's two of your picks right there. And then the other two were probably picks that had protections on them that were uh, future Grizzlies picks uh, in upcoming drafts. And a year ago when they were offered that no one expected the Grizzlies picks to ever have this much value. Like, I don't really think that anyone anticipated the Grizzlies picks having this much value before all the John Morant stuff fell apart. So to say one for one, if an Oklahoma city or the Sixers who have a Clippers pick and the Sixers who have their own picks that years from now could be more valuable or the Pelicans or one of these teams offers good picks. That's mm. the difference to me. The difference yes. to me is that all the picks that Memphis ever put on the table for OG Ananobi and Mikhail Bridges, they were never seen as high upside picks. And these picks that these other teams have collected that could potentially trade for Mikhail Bridges, they are potential high upside picks. Like they, they, there's at least some value. The Sixers pick like in a year from now or, or two years from now doesn't have much value, but like the, the far out ones are the ones that if I'm trading a player of Mikhail Bridges caliber knowing the, what the market is for that kind of archetype of player, and he's on a good contract, that's why I'm looking to get these really high upside picks. I actually think the more Mori move or the more savvy GM move is actually getting Cam Johnson if he's available. Yes. Because yeah. Cam, I know they make a similar amount of money and Mikhail's a better player. Cam is an elite shooter for his size. Yeah. Um, he at least can pass on defense, guard his position, um and is a a guy who we've seen all these guys in the playoffs and cam played well in the finals for the suns a few years ago he played well for the nets in the Sixers series last year and he wouldn't cost as much if he were available i think that's the kind of guy that maury would be like let's give two first for cam johnson as opposed to let's give four first to Mik- for mikhail bridges so if they were to make those if they ever made those guys available i think that would be more of the mori move but let's talk about the guys who are more realistic because the nets are one of the more interesting teams at this deadline to me let's talk about the guys that could potentially become available via trade because i don't think they're going to trade claxton cam johnson or bridges i don't think cam johnson if they're if if a team offers them two first round picks and they're like we're trying to build up for a star trade anyway Maybe we should just try to get the picks instead. That's a possibility, I'll say. Claxton and, and Bridges, I don't see it at this deadline, but I don't know. The Nets have surprised me before. Maybe they will. So let's talk about Dorian Finney-Smith. Let's talk about Royce O'Neal. Let's talk about Spencer Dinwiddie. Let's talk about pretty much everyone on their team. 
<laughs> like they're another team that like even Dennis Smith Jr. Like he might help the Bucks if they traded. They've made trades with the Bucks before. Maybe he would help them. I was I was looking at like Lonnie Walker and like trying sure, to figure Lonnie out Walker. If, like, he has he has like because he's such a small contract. Like would anyone give you like money for? Because Lonnie Walker has been fucking hooping, you know. But like, yeah. what is you know what is that worth in like? That's the uh, hard part because it would have to yeah. it would have to be to a team with cap space because they don't have his bird rights because he was a minimum yeah. deal. It's it's, right. it's the Ubre situation where like I've heard people say uh, that they wouldn't trade Ubre. I'm not saying that they would, but like mm. if he were, I think Spike Eskin and Mike Levin talked about this on Race Ricky Sanchez. If Ubre were made available on a trade, I'm like he's way more valuable to the Sixers than he is to another team because another team can acquire him and get his bird rights. And then re-sign him unless they have cap space. And the Sixers are one of the few teams that actually does have cap space and can potentially keep Kelly Oubre after this season because they could eat into that cap space to re, uh, to re-sign him. So that's the same thing as Lonnie Walker, where like Lonnie's on a minimum deal. If you acquire him in a trade, you have to you have to be the Magic or the Sixers basically. And be a good enough team that has cap or the Pistons, <laughs> like, that kind of team that has cap space this upcoming offseason and is able to re sign him. Right. Exactly. And, and like, I, I think that's the, that's the barriers. Everyone else on their squad, like, like, you know, if you are trading, I don't think they should trade Claxton. I think he's probably the least tradable yeah. of these guys on their, on their roster. Um, Cause I think he's good and, you know, you're going to have to pay him this off season, but like, who cares, you know? Um, and obviously Ben Simmons is extremely available, but you know, is a toxic asset at this point. So um, Cam Johnson, Mikhail Bridges, and are, are like the, as we just talked about older than you think. And, you know, they probably won't get traded at this deadline, but like everybody else on the team is kind of young though. Like Noah Clowney and Derek Weinhardt aren't getting traded. Um, Cam Thomas is still, doing yeah, a lot of things them. yeah and then you're stuck and then you're down that's a like, way to put it yeah <laughs> and then it's like uh, there, it's pretty much reclamation projects after that with like you know lonnie walker harry giles and Dennis smith jr and trendon wofford's been playing well um again a reclamation guy i don't really think has trade value and then the only guy i didn't mention is cam thomas who like is very polarizing i don't think he's going to be traded one way or another um so Honestly, I think it's just those three guys at the deadline that are going to have serious traction, to be honest. Yeah, it's it, it's it's yeah. Royce O'Neal, Dorian Finney-Smith, and Spencer Dinwiddie. And I would say yeah. if there's one guy, if there's – all right, so let, let's look at it like this. I think Dinwiddie yeah. is almost certain to get traded at this deadline. I think that Dinwiddie is – he's uh -huh. basically said he's not in their future plans. <laughs> like, he's kind of already admitted that. He's a guy that probably could help as a bench guard and a contender. He's someone I think the Sixers should be interested in. He's someone I think that even if the Magic wanted to go in that direction, if they really needed a bench guard, he's someone I think that they should be interested in. The guy that I am interested to see, because Dorian Finney-Smith is someone who, he, how is he sneaky old? Dorian yeah. Finney-Smith is 30 years old. I don't think a lot of people realize that because he kind of popped onto the scene later with Luca in Dallas, but he's 30. And Royce O'Neal is also 30 years old. And those are two guys, I think, if we could, if we're sitting here in June and we're talking about guys that were traded at the deadline that made an impact on the playoffs, to me, those two are the guys that are realistically available that could go mm -hmm. to another team. Royce O'Neal is basically, as we've just, he's like a different version of DeAnthony Melton. He's like wing, a wingier version of DeAnthony Melton in that, yeah. like, He's not an elite defender, but he's he's good on that end. I mean, Melton's a better team defender and, and generates more turnovers. But Royce O'Neal is, is good enough on defense. He's terrible at finishing inside. Uh, mm -hmm. He is uh, a good high-volume three-point shooter that has crazy range. Like, he shoots... For a role player, he shoots further out than anyone in the league. Like most most guys that shoot long threes are like Dame, Steph, Trey, Porzingis, those guys. Royce goes way, way far out uh, and shoots threes. Um, and also is a positive passer. Like he can make extra passes. He's low key, a guy who like really good connective guy, but also can run some offense. Uh, he He's kind of like a Melton mix with Bruce Brown type, but not quite as good uh as as that archetype uh, of player but he's like a, a nice mix between the two of them 
I would be really interested to see who who would be interested in in him and trading for him. Could it be like the Bucks or the Celtics if they can get to the money? Or, or one of these teams that's out there. I know the Lakers have been interested in both Dorian Finney-Smith and uh, Royce O'Neal. I would be interested to see if they can acquire, if they give up that first, that far out first round pick for both of those guys. I would really like that for the Lakers. I think he fits with both. And then the last thing about Dorian Finney-Smith, I think he's going to be the guy that has the most value that they actually could realistically trade. Because Finney-Smith yeah. is a guy who is, like I said, low usage, Shoots a ton of corner threes. He's basically new PJ Tucker. He's going to yeah. defend his ass off on the other end. He's going to shoot a ton of threes. He's actually better around the basket than than PJ Tucker is at finishing because he's a he he's a bigger guy. But he is someone that I think could help a contender. And I see people in the comments asking, could the Sixers be interested in him? The thing that I would be scared of if I'm a contender and I'm trading for Dorian Finney Smith is one, how much does it cost? Because their teams like the Kings, as people have pointed out, are probably going to be interested in him. Their teams like the Heat that could be interested in him. There are teams like the Pacers that could be interested in him. And I think all of those teams would be willing to give up. If the, if we're talking, we're getting into the two first round pick range, I'm out on Dorian Finney Smith. If we're talking about one first round pick and like here's Jaden Springer and salary filler, I'd be very interested in him. The other element of that that I'm not positive about is. Does Nick Nurse, who has famously benched Robert Covington on the Sixers this year, trust guys who can't create at all in the playoffs? Because that is something that I would be scared of happening if he were to come here and Nurse is like, I'm not playing you because you can't create your own shot at all. Now, he's a good corner shooter. He can finish around the basket and he can defend, but he is... Like he's basically like I said, I think I said before uh before he's like 70% of OG and Anobi for like a third the price. But the problem is the difference in that 30% is like OG, you trust OG way more with the ball than you do Dorian Finney Smith. And a lot of coaches I think are moving towards not trusting those archetypes of players as you get deeper into the playoffs. Yeah. Yeah. And I just think that you know, teams want wing help for, for a lot of this stuff, but like at, you know, like uh, th these guys we're talking about, all three of those guys are not like starter quality. Uh, Finney Smith is probably the closest, but none of them are he like could be starter the fifth, I think quality. he could be like the fifth guy. Fifth yeah. guy yeah. yeah. None, none of them are like starter quality guys. You're talking about like bolstering your like playoff rotation at that point, if yeah. you're like serious about things. And I just, I don't think, I wonder if team, teams aren't paying that much for a, a, premium, a yeah. starter or a six guy, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. And like, I'm looking at Finney Smith's playoff stats. Um, it's pretty much exactly what I said. Like, he's not great inside the arc, but the three point shot is pretty consistent. Like, he shoots, he's a 41.7% career three point uh, shooter, but a lot of those games he was working off of Luka. And that's where I think that teams that aren't heliocentric, that don't have a hyper shot creator, might struggle a little bit to get him involved in a way. Because, like, I look at the way the Sixers play now and, like, there are players on the team that kind of drive me insane sometimes, like Marcus Morris and Tobias Harris. But Nurse clearly likes having those guys because they can at least extend a possession. It's not a they're not gonna do the Grant Williams record scratch, which is why the Celtics got rid of Grant Williams. Is that Grant yeah. is a very good three-point shooter and he can provide some things on the defensive end in certain matchups, but he can be a record scratch guy as well. And that's something that I think that teams would worry about with Dorian Finney Smith, but I I, I think that it would be a worthy flyer uh, if the Sixers were able. I, I would be interested in all three of those guys. If Royce O'Neal, like, once again, I'm into the idea of low usage players that can survive on defense and are specifically in roles that it, that are created for them. Um, but I, I don't think that there would be like a crazy overpay for, for any of these guys. I, I think that they, they I think they're going to get back like best case scenario, a fake first for Royce O'Neal seconds for Spencer Dinwiddie. And then, uh, for Dorian Finney Smith, if you can get two first, maybe a real first and a fake first, I would definitely try for that. Obviously if I'm the nets and I think the reality is that he probably gets back like a first and a prospect and maybe some seconds as well. So that's, that's where I'm looking at. I just think the te teams are so wing deprived and like ever, I mean, look at OG, like I know OG didn't end up going for a haul, but like 
teams were dying to get OG and Anobi for a year. And like, he's a really no. good player, but he's, he, he's realistically like only someone that's worth over, overpaying for if you have everything else in place. And yeah. uh, that's why I think that teams will talk themselves into Dorian Finney-Smith because Dorian Finney-Smith is going to be available for less than those players. And he makes much less money as well. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, so I have a few other teams. Uh, we could do I another have, buyer. Um, oh, well, I, I think I have to do my last seller, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, you have another seller. Yeah, I have one last seller, um, which is good because I think there's only really, in my opinion, there's only really one other super intriguing one. Um, I'm going to go, I, there's, there's another team actually that I'm looking at this, but I, the one that I think is clearly the next is the Raptors. Um, and I know we ban Masai Slop. We no, ban it's back. Slop, the embargo it, has I, been lifted. I think it, that's what I was going to say. I think it's back. And I think yeah. if Raptors Slop is back, um, I think there are a couple guys on this team that you can talk yourself into with them doing kind of this soft reset with um, trading OG. You know, um, uh, you mentioned on the stream or one of the old pods, you know, that <laughs> Masai is threatening um to uh see how it looks with pascal <laughs> and subject us to you know another year of this i think pascal ultimately gets traded which makes guys like gary trent jr chris boucher who is quietly 30 years old did you know that yeah chris he, he, he's 30 years really old. old when he came into the league yeah i mean he was yeah so or, yeah, or, I, i'm sorry by the time i knew who he was in like 2020 he yeah. was already like 25, 24, or no, 26. Even like Schroeder, I think, could be available for the right price, but I don't think he's necessarily got that kind of trade value. But like they, they might try to like get off of the Yaka Bertle thing when he becomes available for trade here in a few days. So like I, I, I think there are some guys who could be available there, but like Pascal is the obvious like next domino to fall there. So Gary Trent Jr., Pascal Siakam, Dennis Schroeder, yeah. Otto Porter Jr., what I would say are the four most likely to be traded at this deadline. We'll see with Yaka Pertle. I maybe they just want a normal center now that Scotty can shoot and they're adding yeah. more shooting with quickly to the team and they're saying we want to have a normal center for their development and whatever. Mm -hmm. I I would I, I think Siakam is still the most likely to be traded, but I I'm not not holding my breath on that at all. I, I I if it were any other GM and they said we want to see how this like remember Donovan Mitchell when the Jazz were like oh we're not gonna trade just because we traded Rudy doesn't mean we need to trade Donovan yeah, right. Mitchell. What is, what right. And then he traded Donovan Mitchell. Like if it were any other GM other than Masai, I think that they would I would be like this is bullshit. But knowing Masai's history. He's not going to agree to a deal that he doesn't like. He clearly, re they, he clearly really valued quickly in that deal and thought they could rehab RJ. So that's a different set of circumstances. And OG mm -hmm. was quite quitting on them. Pascal had just had an amazing game for them the other night and still has these games and moments where you're like, all right, maybe it's not the worst thing in the world if we keep Pascal around, even though he isn't the, the cleanest fit here. He's a franchise icon. He won a championship with us. And he's still very good. Like I, I think right. that his his problem has always been the tough fits on other teams. The two teams I know that I'm trying to save the Hawks from themselves. Don't trade for Pascal Siakam. That would be a disaster. <laughs> like I, like, if you're keeping Dejounte Murray and you trade for Pascal Siakam, especially because the salary wise to get, make that Not trade bad. happen, you're probably including <laughs> Bogdan Bogdanovich, which makes your shooting even worse. Don't trade for Pascal Siakam unless it involves Bogdan landing on the Sixers. That's where, that's where I think that would be a real mess. The two teams, the two teams that we've talked about ad nauseum with Pascal, and the ones that I think make the most sense for him are the Pacers and the Warriors. And I, I really wonder. I know some Raptors fans have floated this out there on Twitter, like this idea of was the reason why he was willing to move on from OG and. Uh, and Precious, his other guy, even though Pre well, there are obvious reasons why you traded Precious. I watched him play in the next game, and he was terrible. Uh, so but, funny that Bill – did you hear how in Bill was on Precious? Like, yeah. like well, he, Bill, First off, he said that he, he was a Tibbs guy, and then I was like, have you ever watched yeah. Precious play basketball? He's a big yeah. who shoots threes but isn't very good at them and also is like – 
not good at screening, not good at like he was getting destroyed in the Wolves game the other night on the inside. Yeah. I was like, this is like the antithesis and, and makes bad decisions too. Like this is literally the antithesis of a Thibs big. If, if I'm sorry, but if Toronto and Miami can't develop you, you're probably bad. Like, like I know Toronto. Like I know Toronto's like been bad Hit or miss, with yeah, some of their yeah. rookies, but like they've done some really good things with like a lot of guys. And like, but Miami is just a development machine, man. If those, if you can't make it on those two teams, you I'm, might be I'm in concerned. trouble, man. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and, but back to what the 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 person was saying, and and Cam is saying this in the comments as well. Jairus Walker has been really good in the G League for the Pacers. Uh, he's a guy <laughs> that was a top pick and fits the kind of player that Masai likes. He's a big wing slash big that can yeah. shoot and pass and defend. And I kind of think that if they are willing to include Jairus Walker in the trade, there's a move to be made. It just depends on what else the Pacers are willing to give up for a guy who is expiring uh, in Pascal Siakam. But if they're going to pay him, maybe they're saying, who cares? We'll trade Buddy Heald and Jairus Walker and one of our other prospects. And they don't care about picks in Toronto, apparently. So they can hold on to their picks still. And they could just trade prospects and players that will fit with that team. And maybe they can make that work. That That's the, I, I think the fact that they moved on from OG and Precious, may, maybe they're open to acquiring young talent that might have upside. And I know Jairus hasn't really played for them, which is a little bit concerning if you're trading for him. But I liked him as a prospect and it's someone that fits the mold of the guys that Masai likes. So that's certainly something I, if he, if he does get traded, I want to see him on the Pacers or I want to see him on the Warriors. I don't want to see him on the Hawks. Just pull the plug, dude. Like that team is not going anywhere. You're not, you're not make you're probably not even making the playoffs. If you get Pascal Siakam this late in the season, like readdress it in the off season. If you can't move to Shante Murray, just ride it out. Like th there's no point in trying to save this season. You're just not going to do it. Well, you don't think, uh, uh, if you, you, you don't think, uh, Dolce and Gabbana, DJ Qualls coming back and, uh, Grady Dick from, uh, his G shooting 22% in the G league <laughs> is, uh, you don't think that's going to save the season? Yeah. I mean, they, apparently they, uh, Oh, sorry. No, I should, you're there. You're, you can still hear you, so that's fine. Sorry, I had a uh, I had an issue here. Wait, was my mom maybe it, you didn't when it unplugged? Now I can't hear you, but when you unplugged it before, I didn't. I couldn't hear you, or I I could I could still hear you. Can when, you hear me uh, now? Yeah. Oh, that's way better. Yeah, okay. you just didn't have your mic mic in that whole time. Let's go myself. Are you kidding me? I <laughs> no. It wasn't bad. It wasn't like bad quality because I did. I okay, didn't it wasn't notice. bad. Yeah, yeah. It Fuck. wasn't bad quality. I didn't notice, but Fuck. I but it's, I it's clearly that, better now, though. Now that yeah. I can hear it, so, I've been. Yeah. So the issue is, I, I I gotta throw out this fucking this plug. I have two plugs, and I keep using the one that is fucked up instead of the new one. And I'm in New York in 2014. Yeah, I have two plugs. And <laughs> keep using the one that's fucked up. <laughs> Let's go. Unbelievable. God uh, damn it. I'm so <laughs> mad at myself right now for fucking using the wrong cord. I got two plugs. No, but anyway. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Um, so, yeah. I, I, I would like to see Siakam on one of those two teams. I've talked about him on the Warriors and that fit and how I would really like that ad nauseum. So, if you haven't heard, go listen to other episodes where I've talked a lot about that. So, um. And then let's let's move back. Let's do two more buyers uh, for this episode. Okay. The other teams that I had as sellers, and I these are teams I think should sell at this yeah. deadline. Just to run through this real quick. Charlotte. I had Charlotte, who I actually think has some interesting players for other teams. Terry Rozier, we've yeah. talked about. PJ they're Washington, other, Cody Martin. They're the other obvious seller I was looking at. Um, yeah. But, and you know the Bulls, I think, is the other one that's kind of on the fence. Yeah, you know, they just don't really have Gordon Hayward getting hurt kind of throws a uh, some water on on that idea. Uh but there are other guys that could potentially be available. I I'm I wanted Gordon Hayward on the Sixers for a while, but the more I think about it the more I'm like I don't want another George Hill situation. 
where you trade for a guy who's injured halfway through the season and then he's just never healthy for you and they're probably old and washed anyway. So yeah, I, I'm I, I might be I might be out on Gordon Hayward right now. But um so let's uh let's see who else. All right, so I had the Hornets who, like I said, those are the guys that they could potentially trade. Nick Richards is another guy that if they were if there was a market for him, they could potentially move him as well. But we'll see. Um the uh I also don't want to talk about Miles Bridges, but yeah, he's obviously someone that should will probably get traded. Um yeah. and then uh, the other teams I had on here were the Blazers, who at least can trade Malcolm Brogdon. And then the Bulls, who probably won't trade their guys, but probably should. And we've talked about them a ton this season as well. And then I had the Hawks, but I don't think the Hawks are going to be sellers. So those were my sellers. Um, my buyers, I pretty much, we pretty much talked about all my buyers. We talked about the Pacers. Um, we've talked about the Thunder, the Sixers, the Heat the magic, the warriors a little bit. Um, and then the last, the last one that I'm going to take here, I, we already talked about the Knicks, but th th just to sum up my thoughts on the Knicks, just get a guy who can replace them annual quickly minutes. I really think that's all they need for this season. And then they could readdress everything else in the off season, whether it's a Rogier or a Brogdon or someone like that. Like I said earlier, my last team that I'm going to take here as a buyer at this deadline is the Sacramento Kings. Ooh. who I don't know if you have been paying attention, but you know that Kevin Herter is like basically not even really in their rotation right now. Yeah, I heard that earlier. I didn't know yeah. that, but I heard that on a podcast that he's like quietly being really bad and like not really in the rotation. Yeah. Yeah. So he's playing like 12 minutes a game for them. He played like 12 minutes last night. He played 15 the other night. He's apparently cannot shoot right now. It's apparently something that has plagued him for the majority of the season. And obviously he is a shooter. That's the value that he brings to this team. I think that he's probably someone. All right. House challenge trade. Who okay. says no. Okay. Kevin Herter for Dorian Finney Smith. Ooh, I just thought of that. I like that. I like that. That also takes two guys off the table for the Sixers for me that I, because I would be interested in Kevin Herter. Yeah. Um, as a Sixers fan, I, I think that if if Bogdan Bogdanovich doesn't become available, Kevin Herter is the guy that I would be interested in in filling that role of the tall white shooter that can come off the yeah, bench for the right. Sixers. Um, and look, his defense isn't great, but he's held up in the playoffs before enough that I think that it wouldn't be an issue outside of many series, except for like maybe a Celtic series. But then mm -hmm. again, who the fuck isn't going to be an issue playing against the Celtics for the Sixers. So like at that point, maybe you're just leaning into like skilled offensive players that can shoot. Um, but Herder, Herder for Finney Smith is an interesting trade to me because Finney Smith is a guy who is the thing is Herder's expiring and will probably get a, a bag in the off season if he can bounce back. And Dorian Finney-Smith is locked up for the next year and a half, and then he's got a, a, a last year. I think is is a um, is a player option, I believe. But Finney-Smith is someone that could definitely help the the Kings with their defensive issues, and he can shoot, mm -hmm. right? And Herder is more of an upside play for not that they really need much more shooting. Like they have plenty of shooting on the Nets. They really need more ball handling and creators, if anything. Yeah, but maybe you could figure out a way to unlock Kevin Herter on that team. Uh, oh, Herter isn't expiring. He's under contract till 2026. Did I get that wrong? Yeah, no, he's not expiring. He's He's got three years left. Oh. Including this year. How much money does he make? Like 17 million a year? 15, right? This year. I think so he can pretty much... comes up. Yeah. He can pretty much straight up get traded for Dorian Finney-Smith almost. Like, it's almost... Yeah. It's like 13 to 15. Like, it's pretty... Easy. Like, you throw in one minimum deal and it's almost a perfect match. Yeah, I think I think you can. I think because neither of those teams are. I think both those teams are under the tax, so I think the salary matching is pretty lax. I think you can do that. Let me just. Yeah. While you're talking, I'll I'll investigate. But I I think that works. Yeah, because Dorian Dorian Finney Smith makes almost fourteen million. So yeah, you can definitely do this. I'm just gonna make sure. But yeah. Hmm. Yeah. yeah well, works. So. And. And the Kings get a trade exception. Unbelievable! Wow. This is this is perfect Easy. trade. Easy money, perfect trade. 
This is basically this is basically 18... a what? I didn't realize the Nets have two different eighteen and nineteen million dollar trade exceptions Huge. for Joe Harris and Kevin Durant. Yep. Why am I not making Nets trades, man? Let's fucking go. I know they have a ton of trade exceptions right now. So, yep. and I I do just want to point out that if you were to do that trade, mm-hmm. it's basically like the minor minuscule version of the OG for quickly trade. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> it's basically like, hey, we're we're trading for, you know, obviously Herder I, I, at one point I felt like Herder had more upside than he has and he, it seems like he's going to probably slot in as a best case scenario like a fourth or fifth starter, more of a bench guy. But I don't know. I just think that there's in the right environment and I thought the Kings were perfect for that last year that he could really be a, a, a really good offensive player. And Finney Smith is a better fit for the Kings. I, I like that deal. I think that that's a, that would be an interesting one just to keep an eye on uh, as we, as we come up to the deadline here, but the Kings should be looking for defensive help because their defense is obviously terrible. Um, and their offense hasn't been historically good. Like it was last year. The league has caught up to them a little bit offensively in terms of like, if you look at the teams that are at the top of the league in offense this year, the Kings are currently ranked. They're actually all the way down at 12th, the Kings in offense, despite De'Aaron and Fox having like a career year this year. And they're 21st in defense, according to cleaning the glass. So you want to improve your, your defense while also not taking things off the table on offense. Finney Smith could be a nice target for them. Uh, Siakam was someone that was thrown around for them. I don't really love the Siakam fit. I like the OG fit more for them. Um, and then I, yeah, I just think that they should be looking for defensively focused guys who can not be absolutely terrible on offense for them. I think that they need, they need something, they need to shake things up a little bit because the, the, the shine of last year has worn off a little bit and teams have caught up to, to them and, Right now, we we peg them as the regression candidate, and they're actually they've record wise they've started this year better than they were last year. They're nineteen and thirteen right now. They're in the playoffs, but the the issue is that their net rating is like below. Ne- it's a negative net rating, so that will probably catch up with them in time. And I just think that they're going to be aggressive at this deadline and, and trying to be. They're going to try to win a playoff series this year, and it's going to be tough in that Western Conference without some real defensive upgrades. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, so for my, this is the last one we're going to do, right? I'm, mm-hmm. I'm doing one more buyer. Yes. So I'm, I'm just going to, I'm going to say it, even though I couldn't really think of a construction, I think the other obvious buyer, but I also wonder what happens because every time I say this, the rug gets pulled out from under me. Should health hold, I think the Pelicans will do something. Um, they kind of have some Four, of this. 14 good players. That's, what I'm that's saying. the well, problem is that they need like yeah, a consolidation trade. That's the thing is they, they kind of need a consolidation trade. Um, and they have all these draft picks, you know what I'm saying? Like, so that they, they kind of, I'm kind of surprised they didn't do it last year. Like, you know, they were a team that probably could have afforded to overpay. OG Ananobi. But then again, like Trey Murphy's probably better than OG Ananobi when he's healthy. Like, so it's, you know, is it really worth it? So, you know, I I think that there could be like on the clock to do something. Um, the thing is, like, the Zion thing is still not figured out. We're in year five of like, is Zion good? Is Zion bad? Like, can you build around Zion? And, and like, there's still not really answers there, which kind of ruins like everything else but they do have all of these good players all of these contracts they can trade like if somebody like they're a team that i think should get involved in a donovan mitchell trade um if he becomes available but now will donovan mitchell want to reside there almost certainly not but um you know like um we didn't think paul george was going to resign with the thunder and presti did a challenge trade there and like got him to resign and then traded him to LA, but yeah. he did get him to Richard. resign. Yeah. yeah. So, Worked out like, well for them. They got, they now have a top five player in the NBA because of that trade. Right. And so like, you know, like I, I think it's like, I, I don't think it's not super likely, but I think that, you know, 
they have all of these good players. They have all of these guys that are useful. Jonas Valanciunas is one of these guys who like sneaky. You don't think he would be a guy that you would want for playoff teams, but I actually kind of do want him because there's not a lot of bruising big men Mm -hmm. like available. So like, I actually kind of do want him to be available for some of these like other they, teams. They like, weirdly kind of match up well with the thunder. Like they, Herb Jones has been like the best SGA. Def- I think like the two yeah. guys that have been the best SGA defenders are, uh, Herb Jones and Dylan Brooks. Um, mm-hmm. and that is an interesting thing to me because you have Herb to put on SGA and then size wise, Jonas Valanciunas, might be able to just dominate in a series like that. Um, I'm not really sure if if he will, but like you said, like there's so few teams that actually have like massive guys that can stay on the court in the playoffs, and he might end up being one of them. The thing with the Pelicans, I think that they're, I think that they they should be buyers, but I also think that they're probably just going to stand pat at this deadline. Like I think that they'll make minor moves if anything. I think that they're prime. They're kind of in the Grizzlies spot 2 years ago where they're not mm-hmm. quite as good, but like they probably should have made a consolidation trade 2 years ago. They didn't and they ended up trading all their role players for draft picks that didn't work out. And um and I'm just thinking about the fact that like they could they could potentially be a, a team that could really make a big splash if they wanted to cuz they still have a ton of picks they still have all that shit but i i i I, the more i think about it the more i think that they're probably just going to be a team that's like let's see how we look if we can get to the playoffs and then we'll reassess everything in the offseason because brandon ingram has one year left who knows they just have so many question marks about so many players on their team like all of their best players are like can cj mccollum play in the playoffs can Jonas valanciunas play in the playoffs can Zion play in, stay healthy and play in the playoffs? Is Dyson from, Daniels good? Like, like even their young players. I, I mean, I know he's super young. He's like 20, 21. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't like, I, everyone tells me how good he is. And I've never come away from a Pelicans game being like, wow, Dyson Daniels. I know he's very young, but like, I'm just like, I expected based on the way people talk about him, the, I would feel, I would feel more watching the games, like the, notice his presence more. Yeah. Is Jose Alvarado a meme player or is he actually an NBA player? Like, you know, like there's, there's just, there's all, it's all stuff like that. You know what I'm saying? Like they have, they the have so many guys, they have random games where they just destroy teams. They blow yeah. a lot of leads because for some reason, Willie Green loves to keep with the defensive lineups down the stretch. Uh, I know it drives Pelicans fans insane. They've blown the most leads of any team in the NBA this year, I think. But like they have random games where they're just like they lock down teams like and that would be really interesting in the playoffs. But also, I don't know if half of their team can play in the playoffs. They're they're the true detective team. Like, like <laughs> the, the the more I like stare into the abyss, I, I keep seeing like the stars in Carcosa and, and, and all that shit. Like I, I don't insane. I have no idea. Like. I have no. You can tell me the 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 Pelicans win two playoff series, and I wouldn't blink. You can tell me they like don't make the playoffs, and I wouldn't blink. Like I, yep. they, they're like the ultimate wild card. Like I have no idea what to make of them. And that's why I, I picked them as the last team because because of their wild card status, I could see them doing something at the deadline. Yeah, I don't know what that is. I have no idea to predict, but like they just have so many options in terms of like picks salaries players etc so yep no i totally agree i i would yeah. like to see them make just to shake things up a little bit yeah all right Something. last thing before we get out of here because i i kind of brushed over it and i i'm sure people will want to hear about this bruce brown teams if he does get traded at this deadline because he has not fit in with the pacers what what teams could realistically trade for bruce, bruce brown at this deadline because he keep in mind he signed that big deal but it's only it's not guaranteed next year it's a player or team option that's funny. So he basically just got a balloon payment. That's very funny. Um, so, you know, Bruce Brown, technically a point guard, really uh, small forward power forward. Oh, you're, you're muted again. You might have unmuted here. There you go. You're back. That was weird. Yeah. Um, yeah. Technically a point guard listed as a point guard, but really like a six, four small forward power forward. Yeah. Like front, front court guy. So, um, are there teams that like super need that guy? I mean, the Heat I think- are my nightmare if they move on from Low- they find a place to dump Lowry. 
and then they get Bruce Brown and he just becomes like a fucking pain in the ass in the playoffs. Do the the, the Bucks don't have anything to trade if they were to package Bobby Portis and Pat Connaughton, right? Like they, they can't, no, can't they don't have picks. They don't have picks, right? So yeah, that makes that. So that if kind the Pacers of are just like get out of here, we'll take whatever we can get. Sure, that would be a that would be a nightmare for like because. I mean, look, I don't think he's like some like crazy lockdown defender, but he'd be by far their best perimeter defender. Yeah. Um, you know, the the Mavericks could get there with like Tim Hardaway Jr. or Rashawn know, Holmes expiring or, and uh you know, Maxi Kleba's is expiring, right? Don't they have yeah, that? They have that too. Is Kleba done for the year or something like that? Or he's he's, he's like never healthy. He's got two years left, but yeah, he but oh, okay. he can, he's good when he's healthy. So you know you could trade him. Um, you know you could you could trade the Pacers Grant Williams. Like the Pacers might be interested in Grant Williams in uh, signing. They another might they might have up. been. Yeah, they might have been. I I I yeah. might want to avoid that contract if I'm them though, just because I think that they want to have cap space for this summer. I, I want to go on record as saying like Grant Williams will be bad in the regular season. He was for the Celtics last year. He's a 16 game player. Like I'm, I'm telling you like bad. I'm not taking the loss a little bit. I'm not, no, I'm not taking the loss. Cause, cause this is exactly what happened. Like Celtics fans, Celtics fans care about the regular season too much. Like Grant was fine too good. The entire regular season, they freak out too much about I'm, I'm going to make them both. And like, okay, yes, we lost the regular season game because of that. It's very embarrassing. He was one of the only guys who gave a shit, like in some of those games, and I I think that fucking matters, and I think he's gonna give if the Mavs hold on to him, I think it's gonna give them toughness. So I'm just saying, watch this space, big things coming. Um, <laughs> I, I just I think well, the, I, I have yeah. some Bruce Brown team ideas. I I was gonna say the Kings were the other one that I was the thinking. Kings, the Rockets, uh, yeah, the Sixers probably not a great fit, but they just they have expiring contracts and. He could be a useful yeah. guy off the bench for them. Um, the Heat, who I already mentioned. Uh, I, I like the idea of the Mavericks. If he could go to the Mavericks, I would actually like that. Um, and uh, and then you have to throw the Lakers in because the Lakers are have every medium-sized contract and they're involved in every trade idea. So those would be the teams I think that he could fit on. He can fit on a lot of teams if the shot is falling. He's just had a bad shooting year. So if he does become available, like you said, watch the space. I think that the Pacers are probably going to prioritize getting the pace. In in my opinion, the Pacers will, will prioritize getting expiring contracts as opposed to long-term contracts. Cause if they don't get Pascal at this deadline or they don't get a big guy at this deadline, they'll have cap space in the summer and they'll try again. So that, that that's where I think that is headed. But the, the ultimate funny move would be trading him to the Pistons <laughs> Because yeah, he right. got drafted by the Pistons, and they traded him for a second round pick, and then he broke out on another team. So, just something to keep an eye on. But, um, all right, thank you guys for joining us. We almost went two hours on this one. Sorry about my mic again; it drives me fucking insane. But we won't have this issue soon. Um, anything else you want to say before we get out of here? Um, I'll save it for the Patreon. <laughs> So Sign up for the Patreon. I, 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 I have some them. thoughts about some actions that could have been taken to save the Boston Celtics from their loss last night, but I'll save it for the Patreon. All right. episode. So tune in, subscribe to the Patreon. Big things coming. Tap in. Link in the description. Peace. Peace. <laughs>